Good morning and welcome to Life of Community Church. I'm Hal Nottingham, the pastor of Family Ministries here, and we hope that you will not only enjoy the services today, but will find ways to participate with us. We all miss being together for worship. And this is Palm Sunday, the day we remember Jesus' majestic entrance into Jerusalem. And the week is known as Passion Week, ending with his crucifixion on Good Friday, and then his victorious resurrection on Sunday. This may be the first time most of us have had to celebrate these significant holidays away from our church and our friends. But as we sing, wherever it is that we are at the moment, imagine our voices being lifted together as a choir, spread throughout the entire county. Praise Him. Thank Him. Be joyful in Him. Worship Him. God hears you, and He sees you. He hears us, and He sees us. If you're joining us on Facebook today, say hello, and as you enter, or after you hang around, catch up after the service. After the service, there will be prayer helpers available to pray with you. If you have a prayer need, just call us at 517-279-7536. We'll answer and pray with you. We'll keep your request in confidence. And if you have any trouble getting through because the lines are all busy, please just call back or leave the callback number and we'll return your call shortly. During the week, we encourage you to be intentional about connecting with each other by calling or messaging one another. Check on the elder group. Pick up essential needs for those who can't do it for themselves. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever we can. We're so glad that you joined us today. And after the music, Shane will be preaching from Philippians 3. So let's join together in worship. Thank you, Hal. Our call to worship this morning is from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. For this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever and inhabits eternity, him whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, yet also I dwell with the one who is contrite and humble in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contract. Lord, we come before you this morning to worship you. We come before you because you came to us first, to revive us, to give life to those who are without hope. And you have given that in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate you, Lord. Work in us. Glorify yourself this morning. And every day in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're able to stay with us?
Give me 
We are glad that you're here worshiping with us. If this were normal Sunday, we would be taking the offering right now. Uh, we want you to know that you can give from home. You can do that by going to the website, just clicking on um, the Give tab and follow the instructions. We also just send gifts to Lockwood Church, 202 East Lockwood Road, Coldwater, Michigan. The Lord has blessed us richly, and we are so grateful for that. And we trust that He'll bless you too. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me right now and let's pray together. God, you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. As a father has compassion on his children, you have compassion on us. You know what we're made of, how much we can bear. And you help us in our weakness. Protect us, Lord, from the virus, and not only us, but our family and our friends, our neighbors. And Lord, we ask you to do the same for our enemies. Protect our health care workers and our first responders. Protect those who are delivering groceries and medicines. Lord, protect not only our bodies, but also our minds and our relationships. We pray that during this crisis, you will bind us together by a thousand cords of love and kindness so that we begin to grasp the wealth of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. Lord, take this disease, this bad thing, and force it to bring a thousand goods for those you love. In the name of the Son you love, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. And if you're at home, just pray this out loud with us. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are in Philippians chapter 3 today. I invite you to look there. We'll be looking through the whole chapter, but we're going to read right now verses 10 through 14. So this is Philippians 3, verses 10 through 14. Paul writes, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me in heaven in Christ Jesus. Martin Richard was a pastor in the wall town of Eilenburg during the Thirty Years' War. Thousands of refugees fled to Eilenburg to escape the fighting, the disease, and the famine. Unfortunately, they took the disease with them. At the beginning of 1637, the year of the Great Pestilence, Eilenburg had four pastors. One of them fled to escape the epidemic. And Pastor Reinhardt officiated the funerals of the other two. 
as the only pastor left in town, he sometimes conducted 50 funerals a day, almost 5,000 in all. In May, he buried his own wife. During the height of the epidemic, so many people were dying, it was impossible to keep up. The dead were buried in mass graves without services. Each morning, Pastor Martin woke up, he worked all day, he slept each night under the shadow of death. When the shadow was at its blackest, he wrote the following prayer for his children to offer to the Lord. Now thank we all our God. With hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath led us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Was he mad? No, he was Christian. He carried on. Loving his children, serving thousands, comforting the bereft, he was dauntless in the face of danger, devoted to the needs of others, and undeterred in his confidence toward God. How was that possible? It was possible because he had undergone a spiritual transformation that shaped his values, organized his thoughts, and enabled him to trust God in circumstances that must have resembled hell. We've been seeing how our habits of mind affect us, our personal moods, our social usefulness, and our service to God. In Philippians chapter 1, we saw the power of being single-minded. In chapter 2, we saw the relational healing that occurs when people become humble-minded. In chapter 3, we'll see the passion that comes from being heavenly-minded. But I must immediately clarify what I mean by that, or we'll mistakenly picture the heavenly-minded person as someone who never leaves home reads the Bible all the time, and makes charts and timelines of the last days. Someone whose only hope is to escape earth and fly away to glory. In other words, we might think the heavenly-minded person is of no earthly use. That is not the case, and that is not what we're talking about. The ultimate example of someone who is heavenly-minded is Jesus. And he was supremely useful to earth supremely useful because he was heavenly minded. Being heavenly minded does not mean that your principal goal is to escape earth and go to heaven any more than being company minded means you want to move your family into the company headquarters or being patriotically minded means you want to live on Pennsylvania Avenue. The person who is heavenly minded is alert to what heaven is doing on earth and is prepared to join in it. The essence of the heavenly mindset is expressed in the words we just prayed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The heavenly minded don't expect a vacation with Jesus tomorrow in heaven if they haven't served Jesus today on earth. When it comes to COVID-19, being heavenly minded does not mean we think, well, if I die, I die, I'll just go to heaven anyway, which is better by far. Although that's true, it means we think, since I'll be all right no matter what, I'm going to serve heaven today. Being heavenly minded does not manifest itself in escape, but in pursuit. People who are heavenly minded don't run away, they run towards. The Apostle Paul is a perfect example. When he met Jesus and his life was changed, he didn't sit around dreaming of glorious martyrdom in a mansion in heaven. Instead, he got busy serving God and making a difference on earth. 
Paul was a heavenly minded man if ever there was one. And his mindset expressed itself in three ways. In new values, and in Philippians chapter 3, that's verses 7 and 8. In a new relationship, that's verses 9 and through 11. And in a new pursuit, that's verses 12 through 14. The things he once thought were important, he now thought worthless. The person he once opposed was now the most important person in, in the world to him. His entire life had been reoriented around Jesus. Paul didn't dream of escaping to some heavenly cloud where he could lay around and listen to harp music all day. His new mindset fired him up. But listen to the action verbs in this passage. I press on. I take hold. One thing I do, forgetting, straining, pressing on, to win, the heavenly minded propels people into action. The things the earthly minded Paul valued didn't hold his interest when he became the heavenly minded Paul. He had new values. In verse 8, he calls the things he once prized garbage. Or at least that's how the NIV translates it. It's the word an ancient Greek speaker would have used for the mysterious green meat in the back of your refrigerator, or the gift your neighbor's dog leaves in your front yard, or the dead mouse the cat left on your doorstep. That's how Paul regarded the things he once prized. He had a new relationship. Knowing Jesus became his passion. That's verse 10. But see what that meant. As Paul's relationship with Jesus became more important than any other relationship in his life, his other relationships became more important than they'd ever been. C.S. Lewis understood this. He captured it when he said, when I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. When first things are put first, Second things are not suppressed, but increased. Paul had a new pursuit. His life overflowed with a sense of purpose. Faith in Jesus didn't encourage him to retire from life. It roused him to jump in with both feet. He was now working for heaven, and that made all the difference in the world. It energized him. And that's what happens when people who in the truest sense become heavenly. In the challenges that we're now facing because of the pandemic, the heavenly mindset doesn't encourage us to hide in fear, nor to presumptuously ignore safety, ours or others especially. Rather, it causes us to serve heaven on earth right now, to look to heaven and say, what can I do to serve my Lord? That's the opposite of the way many people, and even religious people, live. Look down to verses 18 and 19. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Now, I don't think the people Paul's referring to here were atheists. They were the religious people who, verse 3, put their confidence in the flesh. The preachers of chapter 1 who were motivated by selfish ambition. They were religious, but they weren't heavenly minded. Their mind, Paul says, is on earthly things. Since our minds follow our eyes, one help in maintaining a heavenly mindset is to fix our eyes on the right things. This is verse 14. Paul writes, I press on toward the goal where the word translated goal is a Greek word that signifies a mark or a gospel. I keep my eyes on that mark. I press towards that mark to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul had what people who work with top tier athletes call a quiet eye. The quiet eye is a kind of enhanced perception that allows athletes to eliminate distractions from their visual field and focus on the next move. Dr. John Vickers thinks that the quiet eye is a key to great sports performances. 
that the great athletes had to play on. She hooked a group of professional golfers up to a device that precisely monitored their eye movements as they put it. She discovered that the best competitors gaze longer and steadier at the ball before and during their shot. Players who aren't so good tend to shift their focus back and forth. Paul had a quiet eye that enabled him to focus on heaven's goal and avoid the distractions of earthly things. There's something else here. He also concentrated his energies. This is from verses 13 and 14. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul was a brilliant, high-energy guy with a remarkable leadership ability. There were a million things he could have done and done well, but he did one thing. He served King Jesus. There's power in narrowing the focus of our energies that we'll never know when we divide our energies across a wide field of activities. Do you know what happens if you empty a shotgun shell or even two or three onto a rock or any flight surface and then strike it with great energy with a, a board or a hammer? Nothing. But concentrate that powder and shell. Strike it with the tiny hammer of a gun, and it explodes. Paul had concentrated his energies, narrowed his field of vision, and he exploded on the world in a way that changed it forever. That's the power of heavenly mindset. Another aid to keeping that mindset is ironically to learn to forgive. Paul practiced that too. He says, forgetting what is behind. Now what was behind? Attainments. Like the ones in verses five and six, the cultural signs of success, but also failures. Like his early wrong headedness and his violence against good people. But Paul didn't have amnesia on demand any more than we do. So what does it mean to forget what is behind? Let me give you an example. A powerful storm ripped through southern Kentucky and uprooted the old pear tree in the Claypool orchard. That tree had been there as long as anyone could remember. Doc Claypool had climbed that tree as a boy and had eaten its fruit its, his whole life. His neighbor was over and he said, Doc, I'm, I'm really sorry to see your pear tree blow down. And Doc said, I am too. That tree is a real part of my past. Neighbor said, what are you going to do? Doc paused for a while and he said, I'm going to pick the fruit and burn what's left. That's how we work with the past. We learn its lessons. We pick its fruit. But we don't leave it lying there to trip us up. After we pick its fruit, we burn what's left and we go on following Jesus. That's the way it will be when COVID-19 ends. See, the day will come when it's in our past, and may it come soon. And when it is, we must be careful to learn its lessons. We must pick the fruit. We must get out of it what we can, and then go on following Jesus. That's what the heavenly mind will do. Now, there's help in this passage for those of us who want to apply these truths, and it comes in the form of a few imperative mood verbs that Paul uses, the commands that he places on the heavenly mind. They come in three distinct sections. The first is in verse one, where Paul tells the Philippians, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice. And then goes on to say that rejoicing is a safeguard for them. A mind clouded with gloom and littered with distractions is at risk. The person who's learned to rejoice is not so susceptible, not even to COVID-19. Now, I don't mean that person won't get the virus, which could certainly happen. What I mean is the virus won't get him. 
It, it won't take over his mind, won't ruin his joy, won't steal his hope. But what do we have to rejoice about in our current circumstances? Do you know the word circumstance comes from two Latin words? One meaning surrounded and the other meaning to stand, hence the way things stand around us. The way things stand around us right now, joblessness, disease, an economy and shatters. But guess who stands around the things that stand around us? The circumstance in which our circumstances lie. Guess whose everlasting arms are beneath us, whose glory is above us, whose faithful love reaches to the heavens. The God of Jesus, the loving Father, the one who will make all things new, who wills our endless joy. God is our circumstances. That's why we rejoice. We can rejoice whatever is happening around us because we are part of another, a larger reality in which God is making things right through Jesus Christ. Death has been defeated. Forgiveness has been offered. Belonging is a reality. Love is unending. We must learn to read this larger story, must remain tuned in to what heaven is doing, even as we're experiencing what's happening on earth. When I was a new pastor, there was a big 10 contest between the Wisconsin Badgers and the Michigan State Spartans at Badger Stadium in Madison, Wisconsin. 60,000 fans were watching their team suffer one setback after another. Their beloved Badgers were getting <coughs> trounced. And yet the strangest thing kept happening. As things on the field got worse and worse, there were bursts of applause and shouts from the stands. How could they cheer when their team was getting beaten? It turns out people all over the stadium were tuned in on the radios to another game that was happening simultaneously. See, their other team, the Milwaukee Brewers, were beating the St. Louis Cardinals in Game 3 of the World Series. They were rejoicing over something that was happening outside their immediate circumstances. That's exactly what we do. There is another story. And it's happening right now. A bigger story than COVID-19. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. And because of that, we rejoice, even when we get the unwanted diagnosis, even when our jobs are lost, even when COVID-19 comes to town. We are tuned into the story of the kingdom of God. That's why we rejoice. So that's the first imperative that will help us if we learn to rejoice. The second set of imperative verbs comes in the next verse, in verse 2. There are three of them there. You won't see that in some translations, but there are three. Or rather, there's one that's repeated three times. Beware, beware, beware. Paul knows that circumstances aren't the only threat to keeping that heavenly mindset. When difficult circumstances menace us, sometimes devious people try to deceive us. The people Paul is warning against want these Philippian Christians for their own. They want to use them. And here's a good rule of thumb. Be wary of anyone whose goal seems to be to get you to trust God, or trust you, sorry, let me rephrase it. Beware of anyone whose goal seems to be to get you to trust them rather than to trust God. When I'm around someone who keeps saying, trust me, you know those folks, trust me, trust me, trust me, I go on the alert. Who's front and center? The preacher or the savior? What are they really excited about, the program or the Lord? Beware having your confidence transferred from Jesus to something else, whether doctrine or church or teacher. The final commands come in verse 17. There's two of them there. Join together 
and following my example, uh, it's something like become fellow imitators of me, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. The idea here is to find people with the heavenly mindset, watch how they navigate life and relationships, and learn from them. The Greek is something like, become fellow imitators of me and scope out those who live this way. The heavenly minded, see, they aren't too proud to learn from others. They're always picking up tips from other disciples whose lives they admire. How does this person handle conflict, marriage troubles, financial difficulties? We need role models, both in the Bible, Jesus, Paul, and other heroes of the faith, and in the church, the people who have the love and peace and joy that we want. We scope them out. We learn to do what they do. Let me close with this. Being heavenly minded requires intention. It doesn't just happen. We choose not to mind earthly things. Being heavenly minded requires an offering. We present our bodies to God as living sacrifices for his service so that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it requires a process of transformation. We cooperate in the renewing of our minds. Paul puts all this together in his letter to the Romans when he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's make that choice. Let's present that offering. Let's undergo that transformation. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray together. I am so thankful, oh God, that you know what we're made of, that we're dust, that we determine something that we get blown off course almost immediately. You know this about us, and yet you love us. And out of the dust, you're making men and women who look like Jesus, who are beautiful and strong. Listen, O oh Lord, as we make that choice, we adopt that intention, we offer that sacrifice, for we do it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now we have prayer helpers who are ready to help you pray with you. If you call us, they will pray with you and we'll keep whatever you share with them confidential. So you can call us at 517-279-7536. And if you don't get through right away, right away, just try again in a few minutes or leave a message and our prayer helpers will call you back. God bless you. Hope to see you soon. We're dismissed.